The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Hi, this is Vanessa Marshall. I play Harrison Dula on Star Wars Rebels, and you're listening to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast. May the Force be with you always. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sense was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember, the Force will be with you, always. Hi, I'm Robert King, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we look at the deeper meanings and themes found in the stories and characters in that galaxy far, far away. This week, we're talking about Juggernaut. That's episode 12 of season three of The Bad Batch. Joining me on the panel are Ryan Nafziger. Hi, Ryan. Hello. Hi. <laughs> yeah. And Thomas Salerno. Good to have you back, Thomas. Thanks, Robert. So Juggernaut is episode 12 out of 15 total. So you just know by that number that everything is going to go wrong for our heroes. <laughs> sure enough, Omega is taken back to Tantus, where she's immediately slotted into the same testing procedure as before. And if she gets any more information about why she's there, it's only because she's being thrown into the vault herself, along with the other child prisoners. Meanwhile, Crosshair reveals one last possibility for finding their way to Tantus. Our old friend, former Vice Admiral, and now prisoner of the Empire, Edmund Rampart. The problem? Yeah, he's a prisoner of the Empire now. So, the Batch, with some help from Fee have to break him out of an Imperial work camp. This involves hijacking the massive tank slash transport that gives the episode its title. Once he's free, he reveals that nobody knows the coordinates of Tantus. It was designed that way. But he can get around that. And we'll have to wait for the next episode to find out just what that means. So, a lot to talk about in this episode, but before we get there, there's oh, also some... I forgot his first name was Edmund. <laughs> That's kind of funny. <laughs> I got to give credit to Wikipedia for that. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> I did not know. I'm not sure it was actually mentioned on the show, but uh, uh, I was trying to figure know. out who he was. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while since we've seen him. So I was like, wait, who is this guy? <laughs> when I was watching the first episode. Yeah, yeah well, we last time we saw him, it was like arrest Admiral Rampart, and he's being dragged yes. away. And so, like, yes, <laughs> yes, it's like the very beginning of season two, I think. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's been a while since we've seen this this uh, this good friend of the batch. Um, <laughs> but before we get into the episode, um, I just want to talk a little bit about some news that's. Uh, come up uh, at least since the last time i've been on the podcast um we have some new shows that are coming out really quickly um we have sort of in the in the same vein as tales of the jedi we have tales of the empire dropping on star wars day on may 4th um that was a completely out of the blue surprise to me did either of you have any idea it was coming Complete surprise. And I'm, I'm, uh, well, the first thing I thought of was that meme with Palpatine. A surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. <laughs> yes. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. I love Tales of the Jedi, so I'm all for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I'm actually going to see, um, I'm going to see the Eugene Symphony, uh, forming the backing of Star Wars A New Hope on May 4th this year. Oh, so I fun. will not be able to watch Tales of the <laughs> Empire as it comes out because I will be watching um, I will be watching A New Hope with uh, a live orchestra performing all of the wow. music in real time. So I am excited for May the 4th. And now I have way, I have another reason to be excited for May the 4th in one of my favorite um, mini series coming back. Now, if we can get a vision season three, please. 
Yes. Oh, that Vision is the only way that we can amazing. get May the 4th to be better. So if we could just announce that on May the 4th, thank you. This was my idea. And I'm the insider at Disney. That is not true. Uh, <laughs> Well, way to show the rest of us that we're not real Star Wars fans. Thanks, Ryan. Um, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> oh, man. That that would be awesome. That's almost worth a trip down to Eugene just to see. Um, a- anyway, yeah. So I'm I'm a big Barris fan. I, I would love to see. I'm really looking forward to seeing more of her story. Um, and yeah, I loved tales of the Jedi. So tales of the empire is right up my alley. Yeah. Really excited about that. Um, I am cautiously optimistic about the next show dropping the acolyte, which has a release date June 4th and has mm-hmm. that really cool trailer. Um, like any new property and especially a new a new story in a in an environment we haven't explored a whole lot cautiously optimistic it it, what i'm seeing looks really cool but you never know so what what are your thoughts on on the acolyte well i mean for for me the the whole um high republic initiative has been rather mixed I liked the idea of the High Republic in execution. It has not been clicking with me except for a few isolated books and comics here and there. Okay. But I'm I am cautiously optimistic about the show. I'm I'm willing to give it a try. Yeah. I I I I hate to be a bucket of cold water, but like I hope that the acolyte can present us with like compelling characters because like so far from the trailer I was like this is interesting, but like it felt a bit generic. Like, I really hope that we can get some good, like, um, good, good, like, uh, you know, central characters out of the Acolyte show, or else it's going to be kind of hard. Cause like the one thing, the one thing that I've always found to love that I love in star Wars is primarily the, the, the characters, um, like, uh, everyone seems to have so much personality that sometimes it just becomes a personality overload. Um, but like, <laughs> well, if, it's the it's the dynamic between the characters, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, the you've got these between the characters, yeah, high high energy characters who are bouncing <laughs> off each other, and it it makes amazing sparks. You know? So. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So like, hopefully they can. I mean, like, you you can't just automatically create in one trailer, you know, especially when it's divorced from any other like existing Star Wars like. Uh, I guess storyline as Acolyte kind of is at this point. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't just um, automatically create interesting characters. That's not possible in a you know two minute long trailer. So maybe I'm just being unduly cold. But hopefully it's cool. I I am I am hap- I am cautiously cautiously optimistic if they can make a new, a good a good story and a good world out of it. Yeah. So so you're doubling my cautiously optimistic with yes, your cautiously I cautiously am. optimistic. I'm All cautiously right. times two <laughs> optimistic. <laughs> yes. Very good. Oh, and right Robert, on. while we were talking, I just remembered another announcement that on May 3rd, they're going to be um, do, uh, doing re-release screenings of The Phantom Menace. Again. Yes. Again. Which I, I am desperately trying to find tickets for that. There are not tickets yet on sale in my area. Although they say, you know, like, you know, pre-release tickets, you can get them. And I'm like, not where I live, apparently. So, but yeah, they say screenings will start on May 3rd and that tickets are on sale now. That was the one prequel I missed in theaters. So I, I would really love the chance to see it now that it's back. For, well, this I guess, is going to be the the George Lucas's special edition of the Phantom Menace with extra Jar Jar scenes, right? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> We're gonna get the, I was I was uh, not yet six months of this world when Phantom Menace was released, so um, <laughs> I did not catch that in theaters. <laughs> no, yeah, I had to be like ten. And like, but I, I assume that they will be, be they will be putting up the the version that's on Disney Plus, which has I, yes. a couple of weird like things about it. But yeah. 
But it, it, it's actually my f- and this will be a controversial opinion. It's actually my favorite of the prequels. So I I am actually Interesting. excited. To, it, it's the one that I rewatch the most. OK, so I okay. am interested to see it on the big screen. I mean, it's my second favorite of the prequels. So, you know, <laughs> when I was a kid, the episode two is my favorite. My favorite <laughs> Star Wars. My favorite Star Wars movie was episode two when I was a kid. <laughs> I, that's not my opinion now, but uh, I liked The Phantom Menace a lot because it has one of the greatest scenes in all of Star Wars history, which is the pod racing scene. And it is epic. And it is my nickname. Uh, it is that's my right. nickname. Uh, yeah. Defining the scene. pod racer. Yeah. The pod racer. The only pod yeah. racer. The only one who survived. I mean, and yeah, and that, that, you know, the and the the N64 game came yeah. out of that. I Star Wars missed... Episode One Racer, the video yep. game that defined my experience of video games. <laughs> <laughs> I do Not have joking. nostalgic. I st- do have nostalgic memories of playing that game at my friend's house. Yeah, I've still played it. My N64 still works. Ooh. <laughs> Anyways. Bad wow. <laughs> Well, before we get to Bad Batch, there oh. there is another announcement with an actual date attached to it, and that is Grogu and the Mandalorian. Um, they may try to tell you that it's the Mandalorian and Grogu, but we all know that it's Grogu and the Mandal- <laughs> Mandalorian. <laughs> um, and they say that's going to come out on May 22nd, 2026. That's a little over two years away from now. So I'm going to put on my, uh, my, uh, predictors cap here, even though I'm always wrong when I predict things, but I'm going to predict that that date will change. Um, I think you could safely bet money on that. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Not not much to say there. (laughs) I agree. Um, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to sort of the, the culmination of the Filoni verse, but I'm not sure I would have chosen a movie about Mandalorian and Grogu to do it. Um, but I don't know. We will see. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts? First time Star Wars is putting out a movie in a while. Yeah. Mm. So. That'll be interesting. I mean, here's hoping. I, it's. <sighs> I think the true culmination, though, of the live action Filoni verse will be with the the Thrawn movie when it comes out. If if they keep to that idea, do do you think there's going to be a, a because Mandalorian and Grogu is is a Filoni movie, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, do you think Filoni is going to get two movies, Mando and Thrawn? I don't think so. Because, yeah, like, I, I would I had thought that they had basically said that that was the plan, that they were kind of building to a crossover movie, essentially, where they were going to cross over the Mando story thread with the Ahsoka story thread and kind of end that Thrawn, you know, storyline. Unless they've I'm changed assu- it, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm assuming that the Mandalorian Grogu is going to be that movie. Okay. I think that's what I, that's what I was assuming too. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, as, as much as I would have loved to see another season of the Mandalorian, I think that's where they're going to go with it. Um, but, but again, I am known for my predictions being wrong. Um, so. Yeah. I only make correct predictions. Well, <laughs> No one who listens to this podcast <laughs> will ever believe this. <laughs> and they are right. <laughs> we should we should like count up the number of lies we have told on this podcast just oh, in no. the last 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to get reverse canonized if that happens. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it can't oh, be any worse than than then re-listening to the to us on the secrets of Middle Earth and counting up all the times we were catastrophically wrong about things that were going to happen in the rings of power. Oh yeah. <laughs> well that I mean 
not to rabbit trail too much, but that show was was all over the map in terms of its its lore and and connection to to Tolkien's actual actual writing. So but it, in it, hindsight, it was, what was going to happen is telegraphed in the first episode, and we totally missed it. So <laughs> fair, fair enough. But fair it, enough. it is in hindsight. But anyway, yeah, I, I wonder if if rewatching the Bad Batch again, like once the finale is out, we'll be like, oh yeah, we should have seen that coming. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm I'm hoping so. I mean, I'm hoping they were planting the seeds early, early on. Mm-hmm. Um, but way to bring us back. Thanks, Thomas. Yeah, well done. Um, My pleasure. <laughs> so let's let's talk about this. And and um, I don't know. Maybe let's just start with um, where the last episode left off and where this one begins. And that's with Omega's sacrifice. Um, I mean. She she is definitely one of those. I want to look back at the end of the series and see, oh, OK, this is what they've been doing with her all along. Yeah, because um, she's clearly been a mysterious character all along. Mm-hmm. But end of last episode, she gave herself up, saved, saved Pabu. Um, and. You know, I, I, I don't know the. Again, not to get too much into the last episode, but that kind of contrast between the mountain of Pabu and the mountain of Tantis was like really strong for me in that last episode. And so Omega going from the one to the other. um, And on the one hand, it's like noble sacrifice. This is classic hero behavior, which is what we expect from Omega. But she's exactly where she started. And it's like, what's Again. been gained? Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you think of, of where she's at? And, and like, I don't know, the, maybe even like the moral calculus of how, how do you decide whether such a sacrifice is worthwhile? What do you think is going on in her head? And what would be going on in yours? I feel in terms of Omega, one, she wanted to rescue the people of Pabu. She didn't want them to suffer because they were after her. And I think second, like what she what what she says to Crosshair towards the end of last episode was that think of the bigger mission. I'm just a part of it. Her whole Mm -hmm. thing since she's escaped is trying to get back and rescue the other clone prisoners. That's been kind of her. objective her fantasy of getting back and 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 not leaving any of her brothers behind so i feel like that's what's that kind of informed her decision i think well that's a mission she picked up from from hunter and uh, really but but from the bad batch in general yeah Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. i mean omega was always getting back to tantas it's just kind of a this is an interesting way of showing that i was expecting them to have a big storm the castle moment, you know, with everyone all together, like committed to, you know, breaking all of the cl- imprisoned clones, you know, you know, out of Tantus, along with anyone else they could find pretty much. Um, that was what I was totally expecting them to go for. But like, you know, bringing Omega back captured again for, you know, the fourth time. She's so good at escaping at this point. It's just second nature to her. It's like she gets captured every other day. You know? um, <laughs> but um, yeah, but yeah. she's in her new home now. This is your new home. And so, yeah. so. I yeah, I, I actually really wonder. Um, I think one thing they've been doing really good at in this episode is making it clear just how secure the vault is. Because mm-hmm. every single time they they show the vault, they show like in detail that there's one way in and one way out and that it's guarded by clones and it's guarded by lasers. And there's mm-hmm. no way to get out of it unless you go the one way in and the one way out. And I think that that's actually really good visual like priming up for us because it's like Omega is going to have to leave by someone else's like. uh actions you know like she can't get out of this one i think is the point that they've been trying to make with the whole you know lasers in front of the door you know the army the small army guarding it you know um Mm -hmm. it's like someone has to someone has to save omega at this point 
But who's it going to be? Is it going to be Emery? Is it going to be Batch? It's going to be, I don't know, um, Rex? Is it going to be Cody? Who knows? <laughs> I think we will eventually see that everyone is here kind of storm the yeah. castle moment We've got by to. the end. <laughs> yeah. We have to. Wolf, too. Like, what happened yeah. to Wolf? We need to see where his story, like, inter- we see the intersection with Rex, but, like, they kind of have to show him at some point, you know, what happens to him. And Cody, of course. Like, those are the three. Yep. I mean, I guess those are the two main people. Like, everyone's been talking about this entire, like, as the Bad Batch has been running. It's like, oh, boy. How does Wolf get to be with Rex? Oh, boy. What happens to Cody? We Cody. never see him again after the end of Clone Wars. It's like, you know, um, well, so yeah, there's kind was, of these other questions. And we, we saw him for a couple of episodes with Crosshair. Yes. yes. Cody. And, and then he just he just vanishes. Yes. And he doesn't turn up with Rex's crew. Mm-hmm. So I'm mm-hmm. like, where, where is he? You know, I mm-hmm. think those are some of the yeah, that uh, those unanswered questions and loose threads like Wolf and Cody are they're going to definitely have to tie those up by the end. I got three episodes left to do it. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, assuming that this is the end of the sort of animated Clone Wars thread of things. Um, I mean, I, one of the things I'm noticing is that Star Wars as a as a franchise is is really good at integrating what's introduced in one show into the other shows in the universe and, and sort of carrying things over. So so I'm I'm not sure I expect them to to. Yeah, tie up the all those threads in the Bad Batch. Um, you know, they want to keep telling stories. And yeah. Loose threads are a great way to introduce a new story. But uh, back to Omega. Um, I I really loved the way... So, you know, uh, Nala Say told Emery, you know, you do have the power to make choices. Mm-hmm. And now Emery is... Or... um. Omega is telling Emery the same thing. Um, it's like, you have a choice. And, and Emery is very clear. I don't have a choice here. And um, I'm just thinking of, of the, um, the passage from, I think, First John, where it's, you know, love casts out all fear. And, and there's no fear in love, but love casts out all fear. <laughs> And I'm just like feeling the fear of the empire just mm. dripping off of Emery. And, and yet it's struggling with this genuine concern she has for Omega. It actually, and this just came to me. It actually reminds me a lot of Galen Urso. Because he, oh, say he, more. When he said, I knew that if I refused to do this, they would go ahead and do it with somebody else. And mm-hmm. that's why he chose to stay, work on the Death Star, but also sabotage it from the inside. So he found that middle way where it's like he didn't have a choice in the sense he needed to work on the Death Star program or they would just do it without him. But he mm-hmm. did have a choice in what he did inside of that. You know, he, he did. There were some things under his control that he could do inside the system. And I think Emery hasn't found that. She's struggling to find that place. Yeah, Nala Say was very much in that mode of, you know, showing up at work, but but sabotaging from the inside. Emery doesn't seem to be there yet. I think part of it is because Emery's a clone, right? So she knows, hmm. she has a very visceral reminder of, like, how compartmentalized she is, you know? Mm. As in, like, she is uh, she is not really her own person. She's been made for a purpose kind of yeah. thing. There's also other female clones on Tantus that look similar to her as well. Mm-hmm. So there's just a very like in this in a similar way that like all of the clones have kind of had to decide whether or not they're going to serve the Empire or not. It's like she's just kind of having to it's like a microcosm that she has to now like deal with it's like yeah i know there's there's a million me's out there you know just hyperbolic there's a million me's out there that the empire can just (laughs) slot in and do the same thing um so might as well it might as well be me because at least i can you know 
do something and that's the something that emory has to figure out you know it's like she, mm-hmm. she can do something she just doesn't know what it's going to be and she's afraid to figure it out right mm-hmm. but that that um that you're not really a person you're just a cog in the machine mm-hmm. yeah oh that goes all the way back to george lucas's thx you know oh, that's yeah. been a part of his you know and he has passed on to people like dave filoni that that's a theme that star wars has been dealing with from the very beginning you know that the the dehumanization of people by this faceless you know machine state yeah and oh and that that reminds me have either of you seen have either you seen the movie the great dictator with charlie chaplin no not the whole thing he's he's hitler if you see anything from it see the speech at the end where he 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 talks about, you know, the these totalitarian states, states making machine men, he calls them, with machine minds and machine hearts. Mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. And he's like, but you are not machines, you are men. It's a very powerful speech. And I feel like that is is kind of the the theme that, you know, like, like what Ben Kenobi says, you know, Vader's more machine than man. But he finds that inner man by the end of Return of the Jedi. You know, mm-hmm. so that, but even people who aren't like literally part machine, you know, are being turned into machines by the empire because they're being given machine minds where they just do what the empire orders and mm-hmm. machine hearts because their hearts are being hardened to, you know, the the horrific stuff that's being done. They're being desensitized mm-hmm. to the horrific stuff that they themselves are being made to do. To do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One, yeah. One thing that just came to mind when you said that Thomas was how how this final season has really shown the difference between clones as um as like pa- maybe like passive uh uh I guess accessories to the empire and clones who are like actively, you know, moving on with the empire in the form of their helmets. Have you noticed that all of the clones that have been, you know, good just basically don't use their helmets unless they're fighting. They take yeah. them off. And mm-hmm. the clones that are just fully in with the Empire are the um oh gosh, what are they called? Not shock troopers. What are their names? The um they're like Oh, the commandos. Yeah, the, the commando commandos. clones. Like the commando clones never take their helmets off. And all of the clones, like you can tell when a clone is going is like considering um considering like leaving because they'll pretty much always take the helmet off and start talking to another clone face to face i find that to be a fascinating like visual element to to like see kind of the the um see the the way that the clones like process their um like when when they have when they sort of when we see them making the decision whether or not they're going to be imperial or not it's like are you going to keep your helmet on and are you going to just be an accessory to everything and are you going to just become a body are you just going to become uh you know a number or are you going to actually take the helmet off are you going to have a name are you going to have um an actual have a face. place yeah are you gonna have a mm-hmm. name are you gonna have a face are you going to acknowledge that you have a face instead of just hiding behind hiding behind a mask which is a big theme in star wars this hiding behind masks is a big piece of the puzzle um mm. so i i hadn't noticed that and that's that's a great yeah. insight um i did notice in this episode crosshair never takes his helmet off yeah once he puts it on yeah once he puts it on Mm -hmm. he's you know and and it might be a mission thing for him yeah when he's on the mission he keeps his helmet on but um yeah hunter and wrecker had their helmets off um when they were interrogating uh, um rampart and and uh crosshair very much had his helmet on he was using that that sort of um distorted voice that comes through the helmet mm-hmm. um what do you think was going on with that is it do you think this is a struggle part of crosshair's struggle his identity struggle well i think he definitely used i think he definitely used his helmet in i think he used you know that that you know false anonymity in his uh 
I have to re this is you're bringing up such a good point that it makes me want to rewatch a lot of season two where we see crosshairs like redemption be- really begin. Um, cause like, I think he probably does. Um, I mean like the first scene when we see crosshair, like make his choice, he doesn't put his helmet on. He already has got it on and his armor mm-hmm. changes. And he is like, he, you never see him. Um, you never see him take it off when he's fighting. Uh, I don't think after that point, unless he's like being confronted with the reality and then he's sort of like forced to take it off. Um, you know, speaking right. to, um, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, the last clone on, um, that terrible winter planet. That oh, they the outpost. Had to go back to. Yeah. 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 The yeah. last clone on the outpost. He basically has his helmet off for that entire like episode when so. he makes his decision to kill the guy. Um, mm-hmm. so I think, I that think there's he a... had, he had his helmet off too, when he was talking to Cody before Cody yes. left. Yes. And Cody and was, was all disillusioned. Too. Yeah. 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 And then just as a just as sort of another example of this, Wolf, when he sees Rex, immediately takes his helmet off. And that was what yes. I also wanted to say. And so that's where I really think that like take the the helmets are a sign in 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 batch so far. It's really been a way to see when the clones are being confronted with the reality and when the, and what they're sort of like having to deal with. Anyways. Um Yeah. I'm sure if, yeah. if we, I watch it back, Crosshair is going to have his helmet on unless he's like actually talking to someone who is challenging him in some way. And challenging, challenging him at, at his core level, at his yeah. human level. Yeah. yeah. Not just like in yeah. a battle when he gets his helmet knocked off. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. You know? No. And, and, and Thomas, you're absolutely right. I mean, like the, the mask of Darth Vader from the very beginning has been this this theme mm-hmm. moving forward the mask is is where evil hides um kylo ren too oh yeah you know, we yeah. can do a Struggle whole episode on that <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. yeah asks in star wars episode <laughs> when <laughs> yeah Maybe. yeah we need to Maybe. make a note of that yeah well speaking of speaking of crosshair um i mean I, okay well there's the whole sort of breakout sequence the that you know that's the whole sort of uh plot of the episode um is breaking out uh um um rampart i don't know mm-hmm. why i keep blanking on his name rampart um breaking Rampart's him out first name <laughs> yeah, well, i had it written in front of me. <laughs> it's my secret how do i know what to say they've written it out for me in a script <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah it, so when they're break that's uh just a fun fun sequence the whole the whole part of it but uh i honestly would like more episodes like this because it yeah. kind of it kind of gave me like that that um the sort of a team in star wars as yes. like what the bad batch is you know and like just having this essentially episode long action sequence was a nice change of pace and i i could mm-hmm. see why you know they wouldn't want to do episodes like that all the time but i i happen to think that they're a lot of fun and yeah i i i liked i don't know i i just thought that there was a lot of cool um action set pieces in this and a lot of cool um you know set up for you know as as when, when they were wrecking that planet initially and you see uh-huh. the and you see the bridge and I'm like, I spotted those tank traps on the bridge and I'm like, oh boy, I'm like, that's going to be an obstacle later. You know? Like, <laughs> yep. A yep. lot of good setup. Mm-hmm. Um, and fees like uh, terminal <laughs> velocity, you know, <laughs> fall from fall from orbit stealth entry. I thought you would have pretty... recognized a stealth approach when you saw one. <laughs> they go into free fall too cuz you see Hunter and Crosshair kind of lift off the deck plates and like the helmet was was brilliant. in the air like yeah. floating. Yeah. <laughs> Hunter's helmet was floating in the air. Yeah. So she she oh. must have turned the the artificial gravity off. But... I think she turned all of the power off on the ship. Yeah. That was mm-hmm. part of it too. They're like, "Oh, un- they just dropped like a rock." Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're like, "Oh, it's just a rock." <laughs> yeah oh man 
yeah fee fee is the coolest she's He's really cool um, and her, yeah. her ship has pedals like a car. Did you, did you <laughs> catch notice that? that? Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> she was like pumping the brakes and stuff. I'm like that. That is that was interesting. Well, I think I think aircraft also have pedals for for steering. Um, oh, okay. I mean, yeah, but but uh, yeah, I love I love those details. Um, mm-hmm. I, I I have to admit, I really really want to see Fee and Fennec Shand in a team up Buddy Crook series. Ooh, um, yeah. I think that would be amazing. I want um, I want a scum and villainy series. I want a scum, scum and, villainy and villainy series that right. basically covers like in three episode mini series like particular Ooh. persons in the underbelly of the um republic and the empire and everything. That's what I you want. Could, you could take the name from that one Timothy Zahn novel, Scoundrels. You could do that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and just yeah. call it Scoundrels. That that would be really cool. Yeah, so much this cool. Um, I I mean, Fee's entrance at the beginning, where, mm-hmm. <laughs> where the you know, it was like the 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 trap door opens and and everyone's turns around and has their guns. It's like, do not shoot. <laughs> that was good. He's like, yeah, I agree with that. Don't shoot. <laughs> that was good. Just completely chill. It was like three PO um, vibes there with the Jawas. Yo, don't shoot. Don't shoot. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> I love this episode um, because it felt like I was playing a game of Star Wars Legion, which is a tabletop war game in the <laughs> same vein of Warhammer 40k, where it's Star uh-huh. Wars minis instead of random Warhammer minis. And uh, I just started playing it this week and I was like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh, is that a mini? Do I need to go and buy that? <laughs> <laughs> is the turbo tank a mini? If yeah, so, I need it. <laughs> The Juggernaut as a MIDI would, would be pretty cool. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That I've, would be, yeah. I've got a couple of minis, but, you know, I just started playing the game recently, and, oh, boy, it, it scratches an itch. I've designed an Ahsoka squad of stormtroopers already. Ooh. But, but to the point, like, the barriers made it look like this is just an action set piece on a table mm-hmm. that was, like, I was like, those bears are getting knocked over in three seconds. Like, yep. this is going to be just mm-hmm. an epic crash through scene. And I'm always I'm just so here for it. I was, re- <laughs> I was ready for this particular scene from the trailer because I was like, if the batch is in a tank and they're going full bore assault mode, I have to see this. <laughs> yeah, I remember that from the trailer. I yes. was like, ooh, that looks like fun. Mm, yeah. And it, the episode was also a, a kind of a callback to the very beginning of Rogue One, where Jin Erso is on that other prison planet and they're mm-hmm. using the, the juggernauts as prison transports. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yep. And they, they, they took something from Legends. I remember when I was a kid, I had the old Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels. And the, the Juggernaut was in there. And they mm-hmm. said that in the it was a holdover from the Clone Wars. But in the Imperial period, the, the Juggernauts were being phased out because they were notoriously unreliable. They would constantly break down. And they actually showed that in this, when Rampart and the aliens are working in, like, the bowels of the thing and that thing breaks and the steam goes everywhere and yeah i I love i love the dynamic i mean it was like almost a throwaway part of the episode but i love the dynamic between rampart and the ugnaught that (laughs) he teamed up with i don't speak whatever it is whatever it is (laughs) that was very good that was that was a callback to like original trilogy dynamics <laughs> you right know? yeah yeah the, the humans were very rude to the aliens yeah yeah and just the like i don't speak whatever it is you're speaking we don't need to make up a name for it just whatever the crap the aliens speaking you know <laughs> yeah the, the absolute imperial disdain yes is, yes yeah, yeah. yes it kind of reminded me too of like luke in the cantina with the uh the aqualish Who's just like, you know, going like, rrr, rrr, and Luke's just like, yes, I'm, I can't yeah. understand you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. He doesn't oh, like man. you, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It, it does. You know, I, the more the more we talk about it, the more it's like, yeah, they they are really getting that 
old Star Wars vibe and feel into these episodes. Mm-hmm. And it's um it's great because I, I remember one of the things that uh bugged me about the prequel trilogy is that they didn't have the feel of the original trilogy. Um and that was very deliberate on Lucas's part. And and you know now seeing the larger context, it's like, okay, I see what he was going for. I'm not sure he succeeded entirely, but but I see what he was going for and I respect that. But I very much like that that feel of, you know, witty adventure in a broken down universe that's that's coming through in in this episode in particular but but i mean that i think has been kind of building in the bad batch all along Mm -hmm. and um yeah that's why i love book of boba fett i also like that show (laughs) i like that show a lot oh i'm derailing this so hard i'm sorry (laughs) i I, I mean this is this is i did not get that feeling from book of boba fett and and, so funny yeah yeah and then it's like i don't want to i don't want to yuck your yum i don't want to say you know your experience is invalid even though it is no um (laughs) (laughs) no but i just had a completely different experience of book of boba fett and and it felt it just felt completely off to me which is like okay you know not i am not the audience for this show um <laughs> that's just like, like, like the... <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man i am very much the the audience for the bad batch though when this like yes. the show came out or when the when the the arc of the clone wars with them came out it was like i i didn't know i wanted this you know it's like but why <laughs> You know, once I have it, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is great. Just following rogue clones around on on cool missions. And, you know, and I I liked, too, how um, you actually saw and somebody pointed this out on our discord. The, the stormtroopers actually did some competent military maneuvers in this episode yes yes they managed to do a successful airdrop onto the juggernaut was that you yes yeah (laughs) okay because i was like i was trying to figure out who that was and like i i knew it was you then but in the the several days of like since then i forgot it was you but yeah we were we 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 were talking about that how because i'm at first i was like well why why do they have stormtroopers guarding this prison planet but then, like, yeah, they did manage to almost secure the vehicle. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> and then I one mean, guy gets crushed on the rock, though. <laughs> that was yeah. pretty intense. <laughs> they, they, they were good about showing that he wasn't completely smushed. He was just knocked off. I don't know how. <laughs> it was a murder day for the batch. They were not using stun. So, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes it's a murder day. Sometimes it's sometimes not a murder it's not. day. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Crosshair plan 55. Um, oh, that, you know, oh, it's magnetically sealed. <laughs> Just yeah. like Let's from... use plan 55. <laughs> I already I think tried it. It's getting his mojo sealed. back. You know, like it's from <laughs> a new hope. Yeah. <laughs> Mm-hmm. but i think crosshair's getting his mojo back i, I mean yes. he uh he made the shot using the magnetically sealed aspect to to ricochet his his blaster bolt round mm-hmm. he still has that tremor in his hand yeah. but he seemed to be he's seeming to it only seems to show up when people mention tantus which i think is significant and I think it's getting to be less of an issue. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. it's not gone, but he's making shots that I think he would have missed earlier in the season. I like that Wrecker almost forgets what the plan is. Yes. <laughs> it's been yeah. like, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> plan 55 waiting on you. You know, like, <laughs> that was great. I love the, the, the witty dialogue and the banter. Batch banter. I always, I was batch batch banter. Yeah, yeah. I'm here for yeah. batch banter. Yeah. Yeah, no, the batch is I I am glad because it feels like they are bringing the season and the series to a strong conclusion. Mm -hmm. But I will be sad when this show is gone because it it has been one of my favorite Star Wars shows. Um, 
for a while. Um, That's been really I mean, good. There's a, there's been a lot of good. I mean, the, the critics are out there all over the place, but but I mean, I have I have found pretty much everything except the book of Boba Fett something I really enjoyed the, you know, none of the shows are perfect, but, but there was a lot to enjoy in all of them and the book of Boba Fett. Hey, it's something that you guys enjoy. And I've got other friends who enjoy it too. So it's like, there's a lot of good star Wars out there Mm -hmm. right now. And it's, um, it's exciting to me. And I, I hope they can bring it back to the big screen, you know, with, with Mando and Grogu. Um, Mm -hmm. I hope, I hope they can make that transition again. Yeah, I want to see Star Wars in theaters again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I think we all do. Yeah. Oh, that game of chicken between the two tanks, that was spectacular. Yes. Where yes. The, the one, you know, and then they, they end up using the disabled tank as a ramp and they mm-hmm. fly over in the air. I'm like, they, I'm like, this is great. This is this is almost like um you, you, know, you think they used it as a ramp? I th- I that's it looked what I, to me like they were just flying, <laughs> like they just just flew over. I don't know. It. I thought they <laughs> used it as a ramp because it felt they, like a war game set piece. It was great yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because they knocked the, the front two. They locked the front axle off, and so yes. the first two wins. So the, it kind of formed a little bit of a, a a slope because the front end of the vehicle is now pitched down mm-hmm. on the tarmac. So I feel like they that that was the vibe I got that they'd used it as a ramp. But, you know, I don't know. Maybe they figured out that maybe it has like like thrusters on it somewhere like the like, like the, Bat- <laughs> the Batmobile, the from, Batmobile the from the Nola yeah. movies from the Nola yeah, movie where it can just like, do like those uh, Night Rider. Yeah. Oh, like Night Rider. <laughs> Oh wow! I yeah. haven't heard night, the word Night Rider in a while. Okay, that's mm-hmm. a whole gosh. Secrets of movies is, and TV is, shows. Night Rider. Night Rider. Now. Okay. okay. When is it? <laughs> it's uh yeah. The next time it comes out, yeah. Um, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's uh you know when the Night Rider episode comes out. That's when it comes out. Yeah. Right. What? Um, <laughs> oh boy. Okay. What I'm trying to say is, it may or may not come out. <laughs> This is incoherent rambling. <laughs> okay. Oh man, it's it's getting late in the season. Yeah. We're all mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. bit uh, yeah. Punchy. Oh, one thing um, that I thought was odd was then, and only odd because I wondered why the batch was surprised by this when they get Rampart. And well, first of all, I like that he recognizes Crosshair, and Crosshair is like, "You remember me." How touching. Yes. But then, you know, he, he says, you know, I won't tell you anything unless you get me off this planet. And I'm like, oh, of course. I'm like, uh, th- that, that just seemed so obvious. I'm like, why are you guys? Sure. Su- why are you guys surprised? Of course, I thought you were getting him off the planet anyway, because you, you can't leave him there because then they'll just interrogate him and find out what he told you. So you've got to take him with you. So I just don't know why they were surprised by that. There, there was also like a, a weird inconsistency that the the Imperials noticed that the comms were being jammed, mm-hmm. and at that point I was thinking, oh, the batch is jamming the comms. But then later they're trying to contact Fee, and they're surprised that the comms are being jammed. And I'm thinking, who's jamming the comms on on this oh. on this tank? Was it's it just a piece of crap? That's why. Yeah. Oh, so it's, their, it's, n- it's not being jammed. It's just down. a malfunction. It's yeah, just it's a bad. Broke. It's a bad tank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if my old vehicle spec book was anything to go by, it was probably a problem in the Juggernaut. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually really funny. The Juggernauts were the uh, Soviet Ladas of the um, of the the Republic, right? Or the the uh, the the Hugos the. Yeah. the or the Ford German Pintos. Panther. I don't know. <laughs> the Ford Pintos. Or the, I don't the, think they weren't that bad. The, the oh. German Panther tank where it was like oh, so, the o- so, yeah. so over-engineered that it would always break down. Like, yes. good tank, but <laughs> very high maintenance. Very good. <laughs> yes. Uh. But yeah, and they, they, they finally get him off the planet and he's like, oh yeah, I don't directly know where Tantus is. But I know how we can find out. And I'm like, there's always something, isn't there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, we've got three more episodes. Mm-hmm. So I assume next episode is them going to be finding out with Rampart how to get the coordinates. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and then then probably the beginning of the the big attack, and then the the conclusion of the big attack. Mm-hmm. And- they also needed to show us why Crosshair just didn't do this four episodes earlier when they're trying to find Tantus. Like, mm. he oh. obviously knows Rampart's here. And, like, mm-hmm. there's a re- there has to have been a reason why he didn't just think, oh, we can go and get Rampart off of this Imperial labor camp. Like, this is probably Crosshair's last-ditch possible effort to figure out where Tantus is. And they were trying to figure it out before without... Um, without going this you know sort of last dish effort because the first yeah. thing i thought I mean, was he like, says so yeah, yeah exactly. and he says that that rampart can't exactly be trusted yeah so I, yeah. yeah so it's like they kind of had to show us in an interesting way why they didn't do this four episodes earlier and just risk it you know well but also something crosser said he he admitted explicitly you know Tantus is not a place I ever want to go back to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's a huge moment for Crosshair. Saying that out loud, admitting that he's he's uh afraid, admitting that he's uh unwilling to do this, and that he's probably been sort of dragging his heels, if not um if not a- actively sabotaging the efforts to get back to Tantus. Um, he's always been discouraging Omega from trying to get back. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and now he's saying, I don't want to do this, but I see that it's what it's the mission. It's what we want. We need to do as a team. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he makes that sacrifice. He, this is, th- I, I am loving crosshairs arc. Um, across the whole series, but especially this season, you know, how he is moving from just absolute, this is my duty to, um, I am, I am looking out for myself and, and I stick my neck out for no one to, I see that I am part of a team and, and the team has a mission and I'm willing to put others ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's such a great, um, yeah, it's it's a great heroic or anti heroic arc, um, and and I've I've loved that about Crosshair from the very beginning of the show, and I'm I'm so happy to be like seeing it play out. Mm-hmm. Um, it's playing out really well, at least at least to my mind. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I was though genuinely surprised to see Rampart again because I I was like, oh, I thought they just took him out back and shot him. You know, the yeah, Imperials. I I didn't yeah. realize they, they actually threw him in prison. I'm like, that guy knows too much. I'm like, why is he in prison? <laughs> Shoot him. I mean, from, from the, Empire, the Empires. No. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They're like, nobody gets off this planet. Uh, mm-hmm. They don't yeah. know the bad batch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> one thing that one thing that I've I, I mean, after rewatching the, sh- the the latest episode, I was like, these last four or so episodes, really ever since they had went back to Rex's base and the fact that they were ambushed, I think that I think that if Tech was here, this wouldn't have happened. Like a lot of this mm. wouldn't have happened. Because the batch has been yeah. ambushed a ton of times. And I'm pretty sure that Tech usually preempts these ambush attempts by like monitoring for this sort of thing to happen. So I am wondering, like, how um, I was. I mean, it was just something that I noticed. It's like, wow, like their t- text loss hurt them. Like they're not mm-hmm. as prepared anymore, and that's pretty yeah. clear. Like just through this whole, through the whole series, really, or the this past uh, season, it's like the batch is not as prepared to do things anymore and that's that that was tech's job and like yeah, this, you, this you feel really, his loss yeah. yeah you feel his loss in like unexpected ways too i mean the feet when fee just mentioned him it was like oh gosh yeah that's right but also just yeah. the fact that like they've been amp- this this uh this dark agent you know the dark clone has just been destroying the batch like he can get anywhere and can do anything and like 
that is the it, it's like the anti tech you know tech is i can uh-huh. get us any information we need or at least figure out how to get that information and now it's mm-hmm. like this clone is like doing the opposite of that and no that's not me saying that the clone is tech i really don't think that's <laughs> true i really think tech is gone and i'm really sad but it, it is interesting that they've brought on this like this clear like weakness exploiting clone that has like very obviously um shown us oh wow we are missing a key part of this team and it hurts you know yeah is this um someone was was mentioning earlier that uh fee has been referring to tech by his name tech Mm -hmm. um well, she and called him episode, brown eyes in this episode, I think. That's I think this may be the first time she has this season. Mm. Um and uh and it and again it was to crosshair, you know, any friend of brown eyes is a friend of mine. Right. Yeah, yeah. His loss is it's not on the surface, but it's underneath everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I miss Echo too. I know he's not dead and he's with Rex, but the he would for a while he was kind of like the conscience of the group yeah he was the heart and, yeah 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 and uh, you know it's 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 sad that we don't get more of him mm-hmm. you know i i keep expecting him to show up like it's like you know i i keep expecting them to say okay echo we need you rex we need you and and them to team up mm-hmm. but but again maybe they're saving that for the big the big finale I got to gotta keep us on (laughs) yeah we're just about out of time i i i would love to just keep talking about these characters in this show um uh, this episode i i I mean like some of the critics have said there's like not a lot happened in this episode um but i think i think what what this episode did really well was was bring out that sense of this is who the batch are this is what they're capable of when they get together and 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 get focused yeah how how about you guys what what uh like final thoughts or summary would you have for this episode and and uh where we are in the series just i enjoyed myself from beginning to end like i said i i i like having a, an adventure like this where like you said robert it shows what the batch is capable of when they're, you know, acting like, you know, a well-oiled, you know, uh, machine and just doing their thing, you know, and that they are able to essentially get out of, of any situation, no matter what kind of crazy odds there are, they will find a way in and out. You know, like I said, they, they are the A team in star Wars Mm -hmm. and I, I just, I just love it for that. And I'm, I'm just really excited to see how they close this out. You know, I, I really am. I think that the we're we're going to see the stakes ratchet up in perhaps some surprising ways. And I'm looking forward to that. The match has always kept me on my toes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. It's like, How about you, Ryan? Oh, I am I mean, the reason why I like Clone Wars a lot is because I really like I really like fun action scenes. You know, that's something I really enjoy. And this episode had that and it was great. It like I said, um, it felt like I was watching a war game scenario play out. Um, and that was really fun to see. Um, and I think that in, I think that this episode's kind of like the last, uh, low narrative episode and the rest of them are probably going to be like, all right, guys, we're bringing them all to, like, we're bringing everyone together. Um, I really hope, I really, really hope that we see what happens to Wolf. Um, mm-hmm. like, mm mm-hmm. We've we've got to see it, you know. We've got to see how to how Rex and Rex and Gregor and Wolf have got to get together somehow. We know that much. Um, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, they are going to need to call in every favor, get, get every contact to hit this place. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's what oh, we're absolutely. leading up to. Like we we've established that Tantus is hard to get. They're going to get the coordinates somehow next episode, and then it's going to be all right. Call in everyone. Every single person the batch has done something for everyone. We're calling it in. We're bringing it home, and it's going to be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh man. Well, I am, I am there for it too. Um, looking forward to seeing what next week brings us. Um, but for this week, I think that'll wrap us up. Um, we would love to hear your thoughts about the bad batch and all things star Wars. Please drop us an email at star Wars at sqpn.com. Or you can reach us on Facebook at StarQuest Media. Uh, swing by our Discord server. You can access that through our website at sqpn.com slash Discord. Um, you can help our community grow when you subscribe or leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We are on Apple Podcasts, TuneIn, Spotify, iHeartRadio, lots of others. Um, we have a SQPN YouTube channel. Check that out. Um, we want to especially thank our patrons on Patreon who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Wars and all the other shows on StarQuest. This episode, we'd especially like to, sh to thank Shelby R, Mary K, Audra B, Crystal J, and Ducky. Thank you for your generous support. If anyone else would like to join them in keeping our work going, please visit sqpn.com slash give. So that's it for now. Until next time, Thomas, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Robert. May the force be with you. Uh, and with your spirit. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Ryan, it is always great to have you on. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Right on. Once again, I've been Robert King. Thank you all for listening to The Secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Here's another show on the StarQuest Network you're sure to enjoy, The Secrets of Middle-Earth. Find it wherever you can find podcasts or at sqpn.com slash Middle-Earth.